Good afternoon and welcome Nancy Stevens with the UK Parent and Family Association. And today's topic is hazing. We've got some guests with us today who have some good information for us. They'll be talking about definitions of hazing, resources on campus, UK policies and procedures, and our prevention efforts. This is an issue of importance to college campuses nationwide, and we're um, glad to be able to share with you today what UK is doing in this realm. Um, so before I turn things over to our guests, I want to remind you that they are um, going to share some information with you, but they're also here to take your questions live. So you can post those in the comments and we'll take as many of them as we have time for today. And then we'll continue to monitor the comments um, after today's live chat has wrapped up so that we can get you any information that you may need. So with that, I want to thank you for, for joining us today and turn things over now to our guests from the offices of Student Conduct and Fraternity and Sorority Life. So Mike and Sarah, appreciate your time today and we'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you uh, for giving us some time today to talk about this really important topic. So, um, yeah, we will be talking about hazing and, and how that may impact uh, students and student organizations here at the University of Kentucky um, and share some information um, that we think is really important um, to better understand this topic. So let's go ahead and, and dive in. Um, just a quick agenda, uh, what we'll be doing, we will introduce ourselves here in just the next slide, but um, we'll talk about some hazing overview um, information, some statistics about you know how prevalent this um, this issue is on college campuses. Um, we'll also be talking about our offices and how we interact with, with one another and addressing the, these concerns. Um, we'll talk about how you can report information if you're concerned that this may be happening in our community. Um, and then we'll, we'll end with some information about Lofton's Law, which is an important new law here in the state of Kentucky. And certainly we'll have time um, at the end for questions. But as Nancy said, please let those come in as we're going through and we'll make sure that we, we address those as they come up. So. Um, Let's let's introduce ourselves. Sarah, do you want to jump in and introduce yourself first? Yes. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Fries, and I serve as the Director of Fraternity and Story Life, and we work really closely um, with the Office of Student Conduct. Yeah, and my name is Mike Brown. I'm the Associate Director in the Office of Student Conduct, and um, yeah, we have a, fortunately, we have a really great partnership with our Fraternity and Sorority Life Office, so um, one of the things that we should talk about as we dive into our hazing overview is that this information, these behaviors, these concerns are not specific to our fraternities and sororities. They certainly happen um, in those groups, but this can really happen in um, any student organization, any grouping of people. This is a, a potential. So so um, Sarah's going to talk to us about um, some of those uh, more specific behaviors we might see, but um, we're going to reference some information that we, we've we pulled from stophazing.org, which is a great ref, uh, resource and, and website around this topic. Um, but just to kind of set the stage, this is happening even before students come to college. 47% of students are hazed before they enter college. So that's with high school, maybe um, other groups that they're involved in. Um, and then when they get to college, it's, it's about three in five uh, college students are subjected to hazing behavior. So just kind of laying out what, um, you know, the prevalence of this uh, concern. Um, and again, this is not specific to our fraternities and sororities. So Sarah, you want to talk a little bit more about some of those specific behaviors? Yeah, so um, as you can see um, in the screen, these are just some of the numbers um, and kind of want to dive deeper in them so that you can hear them um, as this is some of the statistics that Stop Hazing has shared out. And I think it's good to recognize so that we know that it is happening and how are we having those discussions? Um, so one of the, the known um, statistics I've shared is that um, one of the hazing uh patterns that's happening is participating in drinking games. And that is 53% of hazing is happening in that. Um, singing, chanting, public situations, not related to even like an event, game, that's 31%. Um, drinking large amounts of alcohol to the point of getting sick or passing out is about 26%. Being awakened at night by other members, so staying up, being awakened specifically for that group is 19%. Yelling, screaming, or cursing at by members is 18%. Um, and as Mike noted, we're coming from um, 
my lens of FSL and working with students, but um, I think this kind of shares that this is not only happening in one of the student organizations on our campus, but can happen in club sports, can happen athletic groups, um, can happen in teams, band, um, and that, that is 55%. So um, this can happen from one organization that maybe the individuals in a student is in, or it can happen from different ones. And so it is not just coming from a group of fraternity for life organizations, but potentially banned or others. And so these are some statistics. Um, we do share a lot of this with our students during hazing prevention week so that they're aware that these are happening. Here are some examples. Um, and sometimes they may just be like, what is hazing? And so we try to have some of those conversations and ask some questions so that they have that knowledge and they understand some examples and where it may be happening. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And yeah, it, we'll talk a little bit more specifically in a few slides about some of the behaviors that uh, may may violate our hazing prevention policy and that we see more specifically here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, but I think these numbers are really important, again, to just set the stage of what we're what we're talking about today. Um, the next section we're going to talk about is, is the overview of our offices and how we try to work with this, this topic and work with one another uh, to educate our community. Um, so first, I'll start with the Office of Student Conduct. Um, many times people think about our office as the place where you go and you get in trouble, right? Um, which is partially true. That is absolutely some of what we do. But our purpose um, is education. We are an educational unit of the institution. We fall under student success. Um, and we are here to help students and organizations be successful in our community, even when they make choices that may um, not be the best choices for them to make. Our purpose and goal with organizations is no different than when we work with individual students in our process. And in fact, we apply the same policies to organizations as well. So what we are trying to do is help them understand our expectations, hold them accountable when they violate those policies, and really provide that educational opportunity for their members to learn and grow uh, from situations that have occurred. In our office, we are managing um, the Code of Student Conduct. That is one of our administrative regulations. That code applies to all students and student organizations at the university. One piece of that code that we talk about is our hazing prevention policy. So this is Administrative Regulation 610. And you can see here what the definition of hazing is. So hazing means any action or situation created by a member of the university community against another member of the university community for purpose of affiliation with a group or organization that is either negligent or reckless in nature, is humiliating or endangers an individual, or unreasonably interferes with scholastic or employment activities. So we are trying to create these membership experiences that, that are positive for these students um, or any member of our of our community. So um, this is what we look at when we receive information um, that alleges hazing. Does it meet this definition? Within that uh, within that policy, there are some examples of hazing behavior that you see on the screen uh, here. The ones that are bolded are ones that we see a little bit more frequently um, at the University of Kentucky. So some of the things that Sarah was just mentioning um, just a little bit ago, such as forced consumption of food, alcohol, or other drugs, um, or other controlled substances, um, creation of unnecessary fatigue, personal servitude is one we see quite a bit of maybe asking a, um, another member to deliver groceries or pick up food. Um, some things that may seem really um, innocuous, right? Maybe not um, inherently harmful, but it creates a power dynamic between the, the members of the organization. Um, you can see some others here, lineup, lineups and berating, um, undue interference with academic pursuits, um, expectation of participation in, in illegal or lewd activities. Um, Again, these run um, contrary to our expectations and the, the values of our organizations on campus. So um, it's something that we are um, we're doing a lot of education with. And Sarah will talk um, about some of those um, opportunities here in just a few slides. One of the things to be aware of in uh, this amnesty policy or in the hazing policy, excuse me, is an amnesty clause that um, we want to work with groups that proactively self report hazing behaviors that are happening in their organization. So again, our goal is to create a membership experience that is safe and follows the expectations of our community. So if somebody is letting 
maybe our office know, Sarah's office and fraternity and sorority life. Um, if they're reporting, say, hey, we we think there's some things happening here. Maybe some of our members are are participating in hazing behaviors. How can we work together as a community to address that in that um, in that organization? So we're going to apply amnesty. We're going to say, yep, we understand that this is happening, but we may not move forward with a violation of the policy if we're able to work um, collaboratively for that solution. One of the pieces that we may do in uh, the Office of Student Conduct when we receive information about um, hazing behaviors is implement interim measures. Um, these are specifically listed in our Code of Student Conduct, but what we do with organizations is that we implement these when there are potential health and safety concerns regarding organization activities. So this can look like things like maybe stopping uh, or ceasing events with alcohol during an investigation period, maybe ceasing a new member uh, process, um, or if, we, if there's enough concerns, asking that organization to completely stop their full operations until we come to a resolution about the, that information. What we do know is that some of these interim measures um, can be really disruptive to members' sense of belonging on campus. Um, our students um, certainly find a lot of sense of belonging in their student organizations. Um, and when we know about that, we are going to refer students to appropriate support services um, on campus. So whether that's our Center for Support and Intervention or um, student orgs and activities, um, we want to make sure that those folks, those students are still feeling supported and connected to our community while we're investigating the allegations. I think an important piece um, that is in that, that hazing prevention policy that we share with students quite often um, is that you cannot consent to be hazed. Um, even if somebody wants to participate in a behavior that may violate that hazing prevention policy, that is not a defense uh, for a violation. So somebody can't say, yeah, I wanted to be up at 3 a.m. to um, do jumping jacks outside, as an example. Um, you cannot consent to being hazed. We know there's a lot of research about some of the power dynamics and some of the um, kind of group mentality that happens around these behaviors. So that's, I think that's an important piece uh, to consider when we're talking about that hazing prevention policy. Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a little bit um, about fraternity and sorority life. Yeah, and to note on that one that Mike just shared that slide, um, this is actually a slide that we share a lot in our office um, that you cannot consent to being hazed. Um, and we want to show those examples and want to talk about that. So in our office, um, we have a few different programs that we talk about hazing. We talk about the resources on our campus. And so this is just a quick overview to give a glimpse of one of the offices on our campus talking about this and making sure students are aware becoming a new member, becoming a member, any time during that process of being in your membership of fraternity and sorority life, you know the resources, who to talk to, um, and maybe some you know signs if you are seeing this in your organization, how to stop this and who to go to. Um, so first we do our membership experience and development program. So if you go through the process of becoming a member, um, you would then go through our new member orientation program. We specifically talk about hazing, some of those examples we talked about today, and we talk about that you cannot consent to hazing. Um, we want everyone to know here are examples, so if they are going through that, they can relate or understand if it were to happen. Um, in addition to that, we do our FSL 201, so this is our hazing prevention program. This takes place for our second year members. Um, uh, the last two years, we have had um, two members who, two parents who've had their son pass away from hazing to share some of those signs that they had experienced, some of the things to recognize in the organization. And um, this is a very um, intense conversation, but showing that there are ways to stop this and how can we come together to include that. We also do our officer orientation and development. Um, this has several different trainings. This training provides for our presidents, our chapter presidents, resources on our campus, how to walk, work with the Office of Student Conduct, how to identify things in their organization, whether it's in the group organization, or maybe it's a few members on the side having these behaviors, how to stop that, how to recognize that. We talk about our event training because we have a lot of risk re reduction we wanna talk about there. We work with the Office of Student Conduct to talk about the conduct process. So organizations, as Mike is mentioning today, understand what happens if there is an uh, investigation, how to support them. 
we talked about intake and training. Um, so as you're going through intake um, and becoming a member, what are some signs that you may see um, that may be hazing and how can you report that? And then we do our new member education training. So in all these orientation development, we talk about hazing, we talk about resource, and we talk about what does it mean to be a member of your organization. Some other areas throughout their membership as a student and a student organization member is chapter coaching. So individuals in our office support each chapter, talking about different behaviors, um, goals that they have and successes they wanna see and making sure that those are done safely. Another aspect is advising. So in our office, we have professional staff that advise the organizations um, and continue to work with those presidents and their exec board to make sure there's success. And last but not least, we have chapter advisors who are previous alum in these organizations, our FSL office and our chapter headquarters and international support um, through any of this process, if there is allegations, if there is support in having those conversations, talking about what might be occurring and changing that behavior, um, we bring everyone in together to make sure it's a collective resource. Um, yes, um, FSL does have different things occurring, um, but we also want to make sure that we are bringing all our resources sources together as this is a collective group and something we want to stop, but need to talk about to recognize how we can stop it as a group. So how to report. Um, there are several different ways um, and we're going to show on a screen. Um, the easiest way to report is to go to the Office of Student Conduct website. Um, you can go to this website. Um, it says submit a report. You can do this as a parent. You can do this as a student. Um, this is how all our reports come through. Um, so you'll click this. Um, the website is very simple. If you don't remember after right now, you can always Google it too. It will be the first hit that you see. Um, but when you go in here, um, that is an opportunity to put as much information as you can. Um, information that shares what took place, what information you have. This might be something your son, daughter, or somebody you know that is at the University of Kentucky has shared with you. Um, it could be even you are a neighbor and you've heard this. How do you support somebody at the university? Um, as much information that's there is helpful because then we can follow up. Um, it's also helpful if we have information to support that student, to give you a call back, um, to collect a little more information if there is not enough there, um, and to just kind of close that loop so you understand what the next steps will be. Um, after that, our offices do take that in hand and follow the information and take it very seriously um, to make the next steps. Mike's going to show the next slide. Um, if you are specifically going through, you'll see on websites, we have different ways that you can specifically report for hazing. And any of these spots you're reporting and it's all coming to the collective group and we will investigate and look at everything seriously. The next slide will kind of show what does it look like on the website? Um, there's a lot of different boxes there um, that will appear for you to put information, put as much information as you can. Again, that information can only help us follow up to, per, to follow up with the student, to follow up with you, um, and to collect as much information um, to make sure that we have that moving forward. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And as Sarah mentioned, um, we look at any report that is submitted, whether that has a name of a reporter attached or if it's submitted anonymously. Um, what we want to do is make sure that we are understanding the concerns in our community and able to address those appropriately. So um, as we share with our students and, and the rest of our community, um, anonymous reports are perfectly okay. It just may limit our ability to follow up appropriately. So um, just know that we are reviewing those as they come in um, and we we are, we are looking at the information, as Sarah said, uh, to the best of our ability. Um, if we move through our conduct process with an organization um, and they are found responsible for a violation of our policies, we do list that on our website. Um, so this is on the Office of Student Conduct website as well, um, that we will list the current statuses of those organizations. So I think for parents and families, that has been really helpful um, when students are going through the recruitment process, maybe to understand kind of where do these groups uh, fall with the university? Are they good, in good conduct standing um, or not? So just a, another piece of information um, that we have there for, for our community. One thing to note also about reporting, um, we would um, appreciate reporting earlier than later, um, but you can report at any point, right? We wanna make sure that we can address the behavior then. Um, so as you look at those um, links, it's important to report when you hear it um, and submit it there. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about Lofton's Law. 
Lofton, this Lofton's law and kind of explain who Lofton is um, and also explain the law. So Lofton Hazelwood um, was the son of Tracy and Kirk Hazelwood and the brother of Preston Hazelwood. He graduated from Henderson County High School. And in 2021, he was a first year student at the University of Kentucky here, planning on majoring in agricultural economics. Um, he was a new member in our FSL community in fall 2021. He passed away after drinking prior to participating in a serenade and having a BAC of 0.354. So a serenade is a group activity. Um, they come together and sing um, and may go to a different organization. However, this serenade did not go as planned um, and alcohol was involved. Lofton has passed away. Today is actually the two years of Lofton passing away and Lofton's law has been pa passed an act. In 2023, the Kentucky Act of Chapter 110 um, passed what is known as Lofton's law. Um, this is in law after his death of October 18th as a freshman here at the University of Kentucky. The law went into motion on March 27th, 2023. And this results if there is any harm or death it is now considered a class D felony in the state of Kentucky. And if there is no cause of physical harm is now a class A misdemeanor. So hazing in general in the state of Kentucky is being taken serious. Um, you can see that this is Lofton's law after a student who has passed away here at the University of Kentucky. There are several other states. Um, over um, 40 of our states have a law that relates to hazing um, that has been put into act um, and kind of following up to take this seriously. So what can you do as parents or families to help us address um, these concerns? So I think one, one important piece is notice differences in your student um, as they may be joining an organization, a group, whatever the case might be. Are they staying up late, missing class, um, doing things that are kind of out of character for them? It may not mean necessarily that they are being subjected to hazing, but it might be one of, as Sarah and I talk about, a yellow flag that can prevent the red flag from going up. Um, I think asking deeper questions to understand their experience um, when they are sharing things with you that may relate to some of those behaviors. How can you better understand what is happening? Um, and again, what is that shift in your student and how they typically operate? Um, again, this I think it's important. This is not necessarily happening in every organization, but it could. The possibility when we, we bring folks together is that this could be occurring. Um, and really it, it occurs on a spectrum. So how we try to address these is we want to we want to address this concern as early as possible and as often as possible before it leads to something more serious. Um, Sarah, anything you want to add in there from your perspective about what folks can do? Yeah, um, I think it can be hard, right? Hard to share this um, because it could be one person experiencing it or a few different people in an organization. Um, and organizations can be bigger um, and it may be hard to know what to do next. And I think that there are different resources, um, but if you're hearing it um, from your, as a parent, think about how you can get that support, how to refer them back to maybe their advisor on campus um, to just talk through it, um, talk through some different, things that are happening. Um, is this a normal behavior? Is this something I should be experiencing? Um, I think you'll see tendencies that they may not share as much, like Mike said, like differences. Um, they may be quick to respond of their experience or share that um, we're just doing these large activities and not really going into maybe some details or we're going out really late at night and I don't know that I you know, agree with it. And I'm kind of deciding if I should continue in the organization because there are some things that maybe don't align with my values um, as I'm being asked to do something that wasn't what they originally shared with me when I became a member or I joined that organization. Um, so kind of look for those. Um, I think it can be hard probably as a parent too um, and hearing this and not knowing where to go. And so our offices, if you're just not even sure where and you're like, how, what resources? Um, obviously looking on the websites um, of student success, but calling one of our offices to say, what would be the next step? Like, I just don't even know what to do. Um, there are staff here as advisors um, and different offices to kind of help you kind of navigate that or help you kind of share that um, with your son or daughter so that they understand which direction to go. And that is all the content we have. I want to check in and see if there are any questions that we can take at this point. 
Yeah, I think you all have covered a lot of good information here, ways parents and families can support um, and, it, and even a little bit of what to do if maybe your student has come to you with some concerns, but they're hesitant to report. I think there's a general fear of, you know, not wanting to rat a group out or some individuals out. And um, so, yeah, if you have any other tips or feedback for ways that families can encourage students um, to be willing to, to come forward, uh, you mentioned an anonymous reporting is an option. So I think that's good to know. And you mentioned um, the amnesty clause, but yeah, anything else that you all might say to parents and families who are, are, are feeling like they need to encourage their student um, to make a report or at least to ask some questions that might be helpful. Sure. Yeah, I think it's it's important to just realize that some of again these these behaviors are on a spectrum. It is not just these very serious things um, that we may see in media or the news, things like that. But you know, wearing you know. Um, some kind of apparel just out being required to do that around campus that then draws attention to that that person. Um, that's something we want to address as well. We want to understand why that's happening um, and help the organization understand that that could be hazing behavior as well, right? So I think that's something to just keep in mind that it could be these really kind of silly things um, that still um, don't align with our values as a community. Um, and I think for from my perspective, um, err on the side of caution. I would much rather take a 10 or 15 minute phone call and talk through what some information may, might be um, than, than letting things go and, and build and escalate in the future. So I think if there's any questions that you all have um, at any point, yeah, calling um, one of our offices, submitting a report, anything like that, and we'll share our office contact uh, information in the next slide. But um, Sarah, anything else that you think is important there? Yeah, I think Mike mentioned it. We talk about the yellow flags and the red flags. Um, some of these small things that happen can add to something more severe. And so if it's happening to you, it could be happening to somebody else or have happened previously to somebody in an organization. Um, and at times, some of it can get bigger. And so how do we um, stop it when it's those yellow flags of potentially doing something that you're staying up all night, you're being asked to um, drive someone here, like make this, do that. Like, how do you stop some of the power dynamics early on so it doesn't result in something more severe um, and impact other people? Um, this, these aspects can also impact that student, right? Academically, um, just knowing if they're in the right or wrong. And we want to help support the entire time here at UK um, and not be this, be the experience. And so um, it's hard. Um, I will say that it can't be easy, um, but there is support um, and important to do it so that you can stop that culture and to stop that um, that hazing and change it. Um, and there'll be plenty of other people there that will be there to support you. So. Nancy, I think it's also important you mentioned this about, you know, somebody feeling like they are ratting out their organization or, or um, kind of um, double crossing their organization, something like that, right? And I think it's important for folks to know that just because something is reported to us does not mean that we then launch into a full investigation or things like that. We want to make sure we are supporting the student in all ways possible that may be experiencing this behavior. So we do talk to them about what that might mean in the conduct process, if they're comfortable with us sharing their information. Um, there are many times when folks want us to know about something, but they don't want to participate in our conduct process, and that is perfectly okay. Um, we are still going to work with that student and provide them any resources or, or support on campus um, that they may need. So um, don't, don't fear that um, just because you call or send a report that this is going to be, you know, shared with everybody in our community. We want to make sure that we're um, supporting all folks involved, including any parents or family uh, that are calling in or, or submitting information to us. Mike, you mentioned um, media reports and things like that. Do you all have any recommendations for kind of best sources of information if folks want to learn a little bit more about hazing, maybe websites or organizations that are doing good prevention work or UK sources of information um, so that folks aren't necessarily having to go by what's in the rumor mill or what somebody else has, has told them or maybe um, even sometimes what they're seeing in the media? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for that question, Nancy. Um, I think stophazing.org is, is a really good resource for um, just kind of understanding how prevalent um, this, this concern is across college campuses and, and a number of different uh, organizations, excuse me. Um, that's where we pulled some of the information at the beginning of this PowerPoint. So I think they have a lot of good information there. If you're more into some of the um, Kind of academic research aspect. There is a group um, called Dyad Strategies. That's D Y A D. Um, they post a lot of their actual, again, academic research. They have a great podcast that talks about um, hazing behaviors, and they are a little bit more specifically focused on fraternities and sororities. But um, I think um, really can provide a lot of good information to to understand what's happening um, and kind of the mindset of students. Um, when participating in these these activities, certainly at UK resources, um, our office and I'll, I'll go ahead and switch to our office contact information while we're talking about this. Um, either of our offices are happy to come talk with groups or talk with um, organizations about the hazing prevention policy or the um, hazing behaviors, how they can address that in their own organizations. Uh, Sarah and I talk with our organizations quite often uh, through trainings and, and the things that she presented earlier um, about why we are concerned about this and how we can all work together to address it. Another thing I'll mention, Nancy, um, is I mentioned the FSL 201 program. This program is actually called Love Mom and Dad. And so it is um, the two mothers that come is um, the Piazza. So Tim Piazza's mom, who passed away at the University of Pennsylvania, and Max Gruber, who passed away at LSU, they come to speak. Um, the Piazza Foundation is also another resource. They are doing a lot of um, statistics and resources um, to collect across the U.S. with Fraternity and Sorority Live, um, and they both speak. You can watch their presentation as they do speak with us here on campus to the students. They also do have that recorded, so if you were a parent wanting to hear some perspective of what maybe your, um, even as a family member, want to hear what is shared, um, they do have that online to look at and to watch and to hear from that perspective. They give examples, too, and Sometimes when me and Mike talk to the groups, it may be specific to that group. It may be, you know, that group does one unique thing or a, a club does something different. And so I think if you have questions, ask, right? Because um, you may not know if that's a hazing behavior based on your organization and happy to talk to that. But those are great resources to look online and watch too to hear that information. That's good to know from so much. Mike, were you getting ready to add something? Yeah, I was just going to add um, at, at Penn State University Piazza Center as well um, is another kind of uh, more research advocacy um, group that I think has a lot of good stuff happening there uh, to try to address this this concern as well. So, yeah, just want to throw that out there. Yeah, whenever there is a loss on a college campus, it, it has implications for students, organizations, and, and certainly friends and family. And I appreciate you all sharing that this is the, the anniversary of um, Lofton Hazelwood's passing. And so certainly our thoughts are, are with his family today and with everybody who was connected with him at UK. Um, I think that that are, is all the questions that have come in, but certainly we'll continue to monitor the comments, um, knowing that a lot of folks aren't able to join us live. If you only caught a bit of today's presentation, I would encourage you to um, go to the UK Parent and Family Association Facebook page. That continue or that um, recording will continue to be available there. We will also post it to our YouTube channel um, later this week, so that you can go back and either rewatch or watch for the first time um, if you weren't able to join us live. But Mike, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing this important information with us. We, um, as a university, want to do everything we can to keep our our folks safe and appreciate you joining us today.